Will you take my hand? What's this then? Take my hand. Will you take my hand? I look into her eyes. See everything clear now. Stars whisper down from the skies. Everything's clear now. This is purpose. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Dalaringi, ours, yours, everyone's digital futures and First Nations stories presented by the Sydney Festival in partnership with MBN. My name is Jennifer Gansky. I am the National Head of Arts and Tourism for Regional Development and Engagement at the MBN. Today, I'll be speaking with Wesley Enoch, Artistic Director of the Sydney Festival. The Sydney 2021 Festival is in full swing. Throughout today's event, we'll be taking questions live from the audience. Feel free to comment or post on Facebook, Twitter, or use the live chat in YouTube to ask your questions. And don't forget to hashtag SIDFest. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal and Wuthering peoples that are the traditional custodians of the lands that Wesley and I are both on. I would also like to pay my respects to the elders, both past and present, and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present here today. NBN is very proud to be the inaugural regional partner for the Sydney Festival. Our aim is to inspire and extend audience reach to regional, rural and remote Australia. I understand there will be further announcements for upcoming, the upcoming Sydney Festival regional tour powered by the NBN later in the week. Today though, we are so grateful to have some time with Wesley Enoch to kick things off. Wesley is the current artistic director at the Sydney Festival. Wesley has written and directed iconic indigenous productions, The Seven Stages of Grievings, Black Medea, the story of miracles at Cookie's Table. He has produced productions of The Sapphire and directed productions of The Sapphire, Black Diggers, I Am Yura, Yibiyang, Parramatta Girls, and The Black Cockatoo. Welcome, Wesley. We are so grateful to have your time this morning in such a busy, busy schedule. So oh. thank you. Oh, you're very welcome, Jennifer. Great to be here. Um, I was wondering if we might kick off the conversation and have a conversation about um, the wow and why and how of you becoming involved with the Sydney Festival. What were your inspirations and goals when you started this journey five years ago? Yeah, I mean, I, I, we have to go back even a little further, to be honest. I remember uh, Andrea James, uh, Indigenous writer and director, she said in a very public forum that my career was very much uh, a freak and that as a director, I was doing a lot of directing around, but somehow might also be stopping other directors from having careers. And I took that on board and thought, OK, what should I do? What should I do about that? And so I started to run, go for jobs, to, to apply for jobs like when I eventually got the Queensland Theatre Company job, where I was there to then promote more about First Nations storytelling and to provide a greater platform for Indigenous artists to have their say. Uh, when I finished with the Queensland Theatre Company, I then moved to Sydney Festival and I've been here for, well, let's call it six years, but five festivals. And my job really has been about promoting First Nations storytelling, looking at Australian artists as a, a key creative force within the country to help imagine what the future might be, and also look at large-scale commissions. And this, this notion of, if you like, to, to act as a magnifier for what are really important stories for Indigenous Australia. I should just go back and just talk a little bit about Dalaringi in this case then as well. That Dalaringi comes from a word of the Sydney, Sydney words here, the language that's been written down by Jacqueline Troy. And when we're talking to Metro Land Council about Dalaringi, they were just saying, yes, it's a very collective thing about how people own things as a collective. And there's a fantastic project uh, in La Perouse called Dalaringi, which is looking at both native title and cultural transference and about telling stories that help a community identify its own strengths. 
And I think that's a very, very important thing, this idea of the Dalaringi project there. And that word is uh, a very important word for the community uh, from La Perouse because they're using that word as a way of strengthening their own uh, cultural sense, but also the storytelling around the place too. So that, that word's been used here. And for me, I think at Sydney Festival, we've been doing language projects about reclaiming language, working with Jacqueline Troy, who uh, is a language expert who put together the dictionary uh, of the Sydney area. And this idea of through language then promoting uh, a sense of place. So in, in, in the Sydney area, just even the idea of saying the rocks, you know, Talawalada. If you can then dual name things, you can understand a much longer, stronger history. And the arts have been a very important way of doing that for me. I think that through art and also sport, we found new ways of connecting into the broader population. So at Sydney Festival, about promoting First Nations storytelling, Australian stories, and if you like to reinvent uh, some of the vocabulary about how we see the future. Yeah, I think one of the outcomes of this incredible COVID year is that this will be, as I understand it, the first 100% <laughs> Australian festival. Um, what incredible opportunities grew out of this for you when you were putting the show together? Well, it was interesting when, uh, of course, you know, the other four festivals had lots of international wor work in there and COVID just by the nature of it said, OK, international borders will be very difficult to navigate. So back in March, I remember walking into my office and off my board, just taking all the international works off my board and just going, hey, what have we got left? And you go, oh, some very strong Australian artists, some very strong themes about uh, uh, the environment, uh, around First Nations storytelling, and the idea of the endurance and strength of uh, the Australian character. And so I went, okay. So back in March, before a lot of our peers, we, we kind of went, okay, let's go all Australian. Yes, there could be a chance that borders could open, but it's a more important thing to back Australian artists at this point in time. I think that uh, it, I have this belief that artists uh, through osmosis are connected to their community, that artists are listening to a community and they're out there. And so whether they, they know they're doing it or not, they're often reflecting a very strong sense of what the community's feeling. So to focus on an all Australian made festival, to call it Australian made in that way, um, gave a sense of, number one, support for the artists. Number two, well, economic support as well, that we're putting uh, a lot of our dollars into the hands of companies and Australian venues and artists to get them through a lot of this period of time. But also we're as close as we can to the, the zeitgeist, to the thoughts that people are going through. I mean, you would know too that it was only 12 months ago that the fires were raging through. So it's no accident that many, many artists are talking about, um, you know, the, the, the bushfires, about resilience in communities, about what do we need to do as a community and lots of artists reflecting that. And walk us through the importance of Indigenous arts representation within the festival. Mm. And how has this changed over the last five festivals for you? Mm. Well, just in that point about bushfires, it, it, I was fascinated 12 months ago about how the storytelling around cultural burning, you know, that burning is part of a cultural practice, was being brought up to the, to the fore there. And this notion, too, that there are Indigenous knowledges that can provide... Uh, I don't know, help to the broader community as well. If you accept that cultural burning, which has been going on for millennia, has helped shape the landscape, that Indigenous knowledge can also then be part of our contemporary Australian view of the world, that it doesn't have to be relegated to the idea of a museum or something of the past. It can be ingrained in what contemporary society is. But I think Indigenous storytelling also can be about connection to landscape. It can be about health and about how communities work. There are also prototyped uh, relationships between elders and young people. So for me, I think that Indigenous cultures have so much to teach non-Indigenous Australia. And often we talk about Indigenous Australia in a deficit model. And yes, there are some things that need to change. And I, I think mostly about the closing the gap conversations, about housing, education, about uh, over-representation in terms of incarceration. But also, we shouldn't just see Indigenous culture as being something that is lacking 
but also something that has very valuable, important things to share, and cultural burning is one of them. So for me, the role of arts is very much about telling the story onto the public record, things that may not be understood by uh, the majority of Australians, that our First Nations Australians can step forward and can say, well, what about this? Or how about this particular view of the world? And without getting too political about it, this notion of the voice to parliament, which is the big conversation at the moment, is not just about saying we as Indigenous Australians need to be looked after, but in fact we have things to share. And I think that the arts have been at the forefront of expressing, if you like, the cultural viewpoint of the world and Sydney festivals being part of that. Yeah, it's incredible. I, I mean, I fully support and understand that arts and culture are really the fabric that make up our society. Um, one thing as um, a new Australian I've noticed is how uh, incredibly important the First Nations arts industry and cultural representation is globally. I remember um, the first time the Indigenous Arts Centre model was explained to me. It was amazing to learn that this model only exists in Australia, mm. that that was such an incredible, um, iconic component mm. of Australia's arts and culture landscape for me to learn about. Um, and I think that reverence and global interest in but that people want to learn more about this oldest civilization on earth and have this exposure is incredible. Um, culture is the true authenticator of, you know, Australia's global arts representation. Um, walk me through a little bit about how you think this year of digital growth and exposure has helped open um, the window and door to the globe. Yes. How has digital contributed? Well, I mean, the, the viewers out there, we're engaging in this kind of debate through digital means, you know, that these kind of talks would happen live. Now we can actually share this material, this content, uh, much broadly uh, throughout the nation and, and, and beyond. Uh, later next, next week, we've actually got a, a, a hookup with Canada where we're doing a four-day uh, conference with Canadian presenters and artists, with Australian presenters and artists. And to be honest, I don't think the Sydney Festival has thought in that way because, I don't know, we've, we're used to the idea of being able to be face-to-face. -face. We enjoy the analogue experience. But in this last, let's call it, eight months, that we've really been focusing on what can we do to upgrade uh, our, our minds, our engagements? What can we do to make sure that we don't uh, degrade the environment any, as much as we have been in the past, just jumping on planes to fly everywhere? And so I've been very fascinated by this notion of the digital engagement is um, uh, not not to replace it, but to enhance the, the analog experience. Uh, look, and even then the viewers at home, you know how much we've been watching uh, things on online, we've been watching the television, we've been binging on, on a whole lot of arts and culture. And then in an analog world where we're perhaps uh, painting or we're in the arts and crafts where we're building things with our hands, there's something about cultural experiences that can be both the analog and the digital and that they can work in concert together and they aren't in competition because I think for Sydney Festival we've often thought of them as well where do we put the resources do we put them in the digital or we put them in the analog and we valued the analog a lot more but now we're finding that there's so much more opportunity in the digital environment. And as you're talking about the art centres, about rural and remote centres connecting up, at, at one point during the, the, the series of lockdowns around the nation, I was chairing uh, a gathering of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander artists from around the country. And we had over 280 people online chatting about how they were getting through, what was the important things, the, the pastoral care, as well as the kind of uh, thought leadership that people could provide. And it was fascinating because those things were always at our fingertips. We could have done that at any time, but the pandemic helped us to upgrade our way of thinking about it. Uh, so even when uh, talking about sales of uh, Indigenous art, that um, both the Darwin Aboriginal Art Fair and the Cairns Indigenous Art Fair have had record sales because they've gone online and realising that audiences have not just been about who could turn up at one place at one time to purchase art, 
but in fact there's a, a much broader market because of the digital uh, cut through and that we're finding more and more this appetite for the from international sources for indigenous art can be serviced, can be fed. We know that over 75% of international tourists who used to come to Australia anyway have always been looking for a unique experience. And that unique experience might be our landscape, it might be our uh, well flora and fauna, but also the idea of what makes this continent unique and that the indigenous uh, civilizations, the cultures, are part of the uniqueness. And that is, as you said, where indigenous cultures of Australia are part of the, well, they are the longest continuous cultures on earth. And someone asked me, why is that? Why are these cultures been the longest continuous cultures on earth? And it's mostly because of the absence of war on the continent that indigenous cultures have found ways of continuing cultural practice where it wasn't about taking over land or kind of decimating one culture uh, in favour of another and that we've had a, this continuous cultural growth and it's because the stories of landscape and connection are so more important so when you see visual artists painting stories of country like um, some of the work I have in my home here you know Teresa Baker talking about central deserts and things there's a whole range of uh, connection points that when people uh, look to this country from overseas they want to find those connection points and arts and culture uh, are the major providers of that I think. Yeah, it's amazing. I know one of the things that we've really worked hard at in our art strategy um, over the last year has been how we um, not just replicate mm. online what is existing. What can revolutionize arts practice simply because the internet exists? And I, I think that um, sport has done a really good job yeah. at that in the past. And um, I would really love to better understand how maybe we can maximize that for the arts and how we enhance that and get some incredible, um, as you said, um, inspirational components where you're merging the two. And so that people are watching something and then seeing what's possible for them. Mm. Do you have any great examples of some incredible First Nation arts and cultural projects this year that have really grown and developed online? Yeah, uh, uh, one of the projects we've got um, called Sunshine Supergirl, which was the, uh, the, the, the biography, if you like, of Yvonne Goolagong from growing up in regional New South Wales through to being Wimbledon champion and beyond. And what was fantastic is Andrea James, the artist I mentioned earlier, uh, she directed and wrote this particular project. And she's been using online methods to gather material, to stay in contact with Yvonne, because um, Yvonne Goolagong Corley lives in, uh, well, in Queensland, so she hasn't been able to cross the borders. And so there's been information sharing that way and, you know, showing things from the rehearsal room to, to, to get advice from Yvonne, but also connecting with young women uh, one of Andrea's big points was to say uh, Yvonne Goolagong Corley uh, is a fabulous role model for young women and uh, especially Ash Barty. So this idea of building networks uh, of young women throughout New South Wales, especially around where Yvonne grew up, and using the internet, using the digital technologies to keep connected and to get them inspired. And that's really interesting. Uh, again, these are all things that we could have done way before but we've never really been focused the way we are now. I, I think also that some of the talk series that we've been doing that this idea of amplifying uh, the thought leadership uh, of the Sydney Festival of Artists has been very important as, as this, this uh, particular situation shows as well. This idea that we've got so many kind of ways of putting that forward. Um, Wesley, I might just pick up again on that notion and importance around uh, digital playing a role in building out um, IP protection and how that can help authenticate Indigenous artworks. Yeah, this notion of protecting artists' IP and looking after them, especially in a digital world. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation around online sales and how to make sure that the images that are done on sales sites are then not used in other ways. 
but also this idea of protecting the long uh, journey of a piece of art from uh, conception through to the making of it, the manufacture of it, and then through to the sales. And that blockchain technology can actually provide a long arc and provide some sense to the person who's the end user or the purchaser of the work that there is an authenticated uh, pathway. That's been really amazing. And there's been great uh, level of politics around this too, because for many indigenous artists, it's not just an economic kind of uh, return, but it's also a cultural responsibility that many artists who are creating art have a cultural responsibility to that work to the collective ownership of the clan, the family, uh, and the long history of those particular um, images. So this idea of protecting it from uh, ex exploitation outside of the, the, the allowed usage is very important. There's a fantastic project too called the Mulka Project um, in Yidakala where they're looking at the digital records uh, of families and how the family then has control over images that might be held at the, uh, let's say, the National Library. There might be uh, footage of dances or uh, still images of individuals that then get recognised as a family member, get recorded in family groups, and then they can add into things like, uh, here's an image of my 21st, or uh, here's a ceremony that was part of our family. And you get a very long history and a, a record, if you like, of that particular family through the digital lens. And I love that. There's, there's a sense of indigenous cultures uh, always growing and being available to new technologies through it, sales, through cultural practice. And what I've loved is this kind of blockchain technology. My, my cousin, as I was saying before, um, Adam Morton Robinson, who's been very interested in putting all this blockchain technology together to protect the IP of Indigenous artists, but also to make sure that the person who's purchasing is they understand the ethical framework under which the work is being made. So it's not just a, uh, a ticker box, but something that they can feel that they, they have contributed to an ethical framework. Yeah, I think it's empowering both for the artist and the consumer in that way, giving us that in-depth knowledge and connection too. And I, I want to reflect a little bit on how you talked about it. It's almost like immersive archiving. Yes. Um, I think, um, especially I know for visual arts, uh, when something enters into my home and lives in my home and becomes part of the, the ethos in my home, I start to think more and more about it. And to be able to tap into that living archive and watch it grow. Um, I think one of the most inspiring um, uh, technology uses I saw this year was an incredible VR proposal of on-country tours mm. to escort children as they were going into cancer treatment, into hospitals, often a thousand of kilometers away from their home and how they could be accompanied by some VR technology that allowed them to go back and tour their country to calm themselves and feel connected while they were going through quite a traumatic oh. healing process. Well, I know that, that also um, the Purple House in Alice Springs has been doing a lot of work connecting people who are on dialysis to country as well. This, this wonderful sense that the new technologies actually help uh, enhance the the already strong analog cultural expressions. It was interesting during the the pandemic lockdowns in Australia that people were saying that all the freezers were full because everyone was fishing and hunting, and there was this real sense of people sharing information about why what they were doing during lockdown and how they were making sure that the young people understood storytelling, uh, understood the cultural depth of what was important because these kids were now no longer at boarding school. They they were learning through, well, the digital means. They were doing the virtual classroom as well, but having a very strong cultural experience by being at home with their old people. So this wonderful sense of uh, an evolution that's happened in the last 12 months. Yeah, it'll be really interesting, I think, to see how that merges and grows and embeds itself further into um, health opportunities, education opportunities. And again, that, that broader global reach, um, I, 
Well, I love Sorry? this. I love this idea too. You, earlier, you talked about sport, and what I think sport has always been able to do is integrate very strongly a health message, an education message, a socialising message, uh, and that they don't see the profession as all that separate from the you know kicking a ball around on a field or or having your regional uh, um, community teams that there's some way of putting it all together from broadcast through to doing some cricket in your backyard so i love this sense that arts needs to have that same kind of idea that we've got an integrated form that we can move from the classroom through to your home to community gatherings all the way through to yes the the most beautiful high profile amazing art like the sydney festival does but how they can all work together and I think that the digital environment is asking more of us in an integrative way to, to integrate the the everyday artist who's the citizen artist if you like who's at home painting and the incredible professional painter as well how they can share the same space in the digital world one of the things that was really interesting to me as I talked to performers over the course of the year and how the pandemic was impacting um, their lack of live audience. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the most interesting things that performers were raising with me is there was a whole new set of benefits that they were finding from performing online that had longevity, that had instant feedback in chat, things that they maybe hadn't thought of and we were instantly just thinking oh they've lost that live vibe but they've picked up a whole mm. secondary um, set of feedback that wasn't available to them previously. And agreed and I think also the threshold for involvement has been lowered as well so you know you don't even just to have let's say to go to, to see um, a show at the Opera House, the Sydney Opera House, you don't have to look at the babysitter or the long drive or the parking or the restaurant or you know organizing your, your, your partner and yourself to get there together or a group of friends. In fact you could do this in the digital environment very very quickly. In fact the Sydney Opera House um, I was talking to them about some of the work, their indigenous work that they've had on their platform has gone through the roof because people have been going, oh, well, oh, I know I want to, but I've often found these barriers of participation. And so they've been getting online and watching some of the indigenous storytelling or indigenous performance that has happened in the Sydney Opera House. And suddenly their numbers are just going through the roof because, well, whatever those barriers have been, which could be real, but it could also be sometimes, you know, we have these kind of mental blocks to go, oh, I don't know, is it a bit too too hard to do? Or the, the, the obstacles just melt away and suddenly you can be there. And I've really been keen on how accessibility in terms of uh, people living with disability, how suddenly the digital broadcast has meant they can go see so many more shows, not just within Australia, but around the world because everything's open to them in a different way. Yeah, it's that reach that really, especially when we're talking about accessibility, regional, remote and rural areas. Um, there's also an incredible movement in collaboration Ooh. online and how you've lost that tyranny of distance to connect with potential collaborations that you might not have had. I, I come back to that Canadian um, yeah conference that you will be exploring and working with and being able to uh, open opportunity. Agreed. It was interesting, we, um, uh, as it's worked out, the Sydney Festival has had one international artist, uh, a woman, Olwen Furrer from uh, Ireland, um, and it was a long story about how she got here, and she had to do two weeks of quarantine, as, as is the case. And um, they continued rehearsals online. So she would get in front of her computer, they would do rehearsals, they would, I think, Zoom or whatever, whatever platform they used, and off they did, and they did this rehearsal so that she was busy for two weeks, still being in a presence in the rehearsal room. And I'm seeing a lot more of this kind of conversation uh, I know that Adelaide Festival, who have been fantastic, they're, they're also doing live streaming from international places so that they're performing in real time on the other side of the world and streaming in. So there's great innovation occurring as well that now we shouldn't feel isolated because uh, the international borders are closed, that the digital environment is allowing a lot more of this connection. In a First Nations environment, I know we've got a project called Yellow Monday, which is a, a playwriting um, a project, a, a workshop of different plays, and they're already connecting with 
people, First Nations people in New Zealand and in Canada because there's been this ongoing relationship for a number of years and they're realizing they can get they can get more people to participate now because of the digital environment and that we can learn much faster we can leapfrog some of the short term things and just jump to long term relationships being built uh, through the digital environment. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. And I, I think that um, we will see a much shorter time in those innovations coming out as well as people have learned and trial some of these. So I'm, I'm really excited about what's potentially coming. Um, now, I'm also really excited about what's potentially coming in the upcoming week for the Sydney Festival. <laughs> yes. Well, we've got um, the Headland, which is at Barangaroo, uh, has opened and we've been doing live streaming from there. And it's fascinating, actually, just to watch those. As I said, uh, we've got 1,700 tickets, live tickets. But what people kind of getting online and watching these performances from home have been fantastic. We've also got works in Western Sydney, uh, uh, HMS Pinafore, the Gilbert and Sullivan work being put on its head. And also a whole range of live music work. Uh, tonight there's a piece called Bomi, which is about, um, well, let's call it from the Indian diaspora in Australia and looking at uh, the role of women and creativity and this beautiful sense of traditional s song and dance from India being put together in a performance for the Sydney Festival. So it's also about cultural diversity. We've been talking a lot about First Nations storytelling. Um, but actually the Sydney Festival has found that the digital environment has created uh, different pockets of audiences that we can engage with. And I think a lot of uh, marketing and uh, exchanging ideas have happened in a way now that audiences may feel very much invited to come and sit in a theatre and watch something that's going to reflect their particular story and then also take risks and go, well, why don't I just cross over and have a look at this particular story from another culture? So for me, I think the, the opportunity to engage is often, uh, how do I say this? Often we've been driven by different algorithms about engagement, especially through social media. And if the curious mind is out there, we can engage in a different way outside of the algorithms of social media and make sure that the invitation is uh, issued for different groups that you may not be connecting up with to come together. So, so amazing things. It's, it's a very um, up and down kind of experience as we're doing border closures are happening all over the place. But uh, I've loved that uh, Humans 2.0, a company uh, Circa from Brisbane that has been able to cross the border and come to Sydney and are doing their show this week as well. Amazing, amazing. I um I can see some of the questions are starting to come in right. fast and furiously from our listeners today. Um, the first one is, what role do you feel technology plays or can play in preserving traditional stories and culture? Yeah, it was interesting. Um, uh, uh, Wakun Wanabe, who's a, a visual artist from Yudhikala, I was talking to him and his particular um, inheritance has been about uh, um, mullet and fish and uh, around these particular stones uh, in his land. And he created this beautiful digital environment that also then kept the artwork swirling so you can experience it internally. And he's moving into a VR world. And so there's something about young people getting in, involved in this integration of their lived experience and their cultural traditions coming together, watching this kind of VR experience grow and how younger people are engaging in a way there. I don't think that it will ever replace the fully um, analog experience. I think I love the idea of the visceral responses to dance, of getting up and dancing on country is always going to be important. But there are some stories and some dances that may take, I don't know, 30, 40 years before they're danced again so that we can keep this digital archive to refer to. It could also be very interesting to maintain cultural uh, integrity and reference points, even if there is innovation. Yeah, that's incredible for generations, isn't it? Mm. Participation. 
Um, the next question that's popped up is necessity being the mother of invention. It seems like artists have really responded and innovated to the difficulties faced this year. Mm. Can you share some examples from the festival artists or others that you're familiar with, Wesley? Yeah, I, 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 like, like the, the person who's put the question, I think artists are a bit like water. When they see an obstacle, they kind of move around it and they change form and they find every crack. Um, I think that the uh, I've been interested in music in particular. I was talking to Katie Noonan, who's got a show with us called Songs of Dawn, and she's been doing live broadcast from her lounge room and saying, actually, it's important to also monetize these environments so that she lost a whole lot of gigs she was talking about and going, OK, how do we monetize these relationships to make sure that she can pay her rent and feed her kids? You know, so what I've seen is often artists like to give it away because so, we're so generous and we believe that it's important to be part of a community and that, you know, we, we love the audience to be involved. But actually watching also how philanthropy has really taken a rise people donating money for an artist to 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 do their work um, they may not be charging admission as such but how philanthropy has really come to the fore and that also the collection of that philanthropic money has found a new digital way of doing that as well so that you can actually you know give a two dollar donation or a three dollar donation um, through these on online sources which i think is fantastic uh, so again the generosity of the audience to make sure that they are looking after artists going forward it's again not ever to replace the live gig but how these things can happen and that artists can build a livelihood both in the analog world and the digital yeah no that's so important that that's a really topical conversation that monetization mm. um and really it's a value proposition that i think um, this last year has taught us that arts and culture is part of the Maslow yes. hierarchy now. We yeah. need it for survival and how we um, catch up in that digital payment world to really get that value proposition and exchange for it is so important. Um, the next question, Wesley, that's come through is what companies do you feel are pushing the needle for First Nation arts in the country right now? Yes, I think the visual arts field have really uh, jumped on this very quickly because you can imagine they were uh, very much um, uh, hit hard by lockdowns. Uh, it, it was interesting in February, NACHO, which is the National Association of Community Controlled Health Organizations, uh, locked down a lot of regional and remote Aboriginal communities very, very early back in February to protect the elderly. And this whole notion of uh, the living library, these individual elders who should be protected. But it also meant that their economic um, uh, sustainability through sales of artwork were really kind of uh, truncated and so they jumped online very very quickly and so you've seen um, places like Ankar, Desart, uh, um, the Darwin Aboriginal Art Fair as I talked about and also Cairns Indigenous Art Fair and here in Sydney also at Carriage Works there's the Southeast Market, Black Market and these wonderful kind of online uh, sales portals have been really quick and in many ways, uh, I think, have led the, the, the whole nation because they've, they've just gone, this is what we can do and do very quickly. In terms of performing arts, I think that, as I said, the Sydney Opera House has been fantastic at looking at their archive and putting it up. But also um, Ilbidgeri in Melbourne and Mugulan here in Sydney uh, have found new and interesting ways. So I know Mugland did a, um, a, a cooking program where they would go into old auntie's homes and old auntie would cook up a feed in front of them and do like an Aboriginal cooking program, which is fantastic. Yeah, it's fantastic. And also the idea that they would then hand over their social media platforms to an artist to either do dance classes or to create um, a writing project and that these indigenous artists have gone, okay, how do we, how do we, well, these companies have gone, how do we look after artists? And by handing over the platform and giving them a, a small um, a stipend to do that, have also built audiences for their work long term. So some of the big resources that go into shows like Sunshine Supergirl, uh, as I mentioned before, um, that the that could be a very costly uh, affair but they've found low cost ways of still engaging artists in very thoughtful interesting uh, shows 
Yeah. Wow. Um, Wesley, the next one that's come through builds on that. What is the best digital experience you've seen? Oh, was it able to match or surpass a physical experience? Well, I, I think number one, you shouldn't try to just put, let's say, performance online. Um, you need to shoot it well for it to be its own art form. Is is the big thing? You need multiple cameras. You need a kind of. It's not just. You can't translate the experience as it is. So uh, sometimes I think that um, live theatre on um, screen is just really very art house film, you know, very poor film. You, yeah. need, you need to think of the medium in a, in a very important way. And I've used the digital um, medium mostly in the, the connections that kind of happen as well. These uh, conversations that occur. Uh, the performance work I've seen is basically really good film. So some of the Bangara work that I've seen online has been fabulous, but they're shot like films. They're, they're not trying to be the live experience on film. They are shot like films with multi cameras and things. And I've loved them and I think they're really fantastic. But I, I also have a hankering to get that live experience back again. But what I've loved is really using digital technologies as ways of connecting with people. And I've found that um, especially public readings of work where actors will read out the words and you hear and you create an imaginative world that those words exist in. And also the international kind of discussions. I was um, the Luminato Festival from uh, Toronto connected up a whole range of festivals, the Lyft Festival, Fusebox, um, uh, some South American festivals as well, put us all together in a room and talked about what is the festival of the future. And that was amazing to, you, you very rarely get those festival directors in one place. And that was a very rare occasion. And I think that that's, that's been important to me. Not so much that I can watch you know, lots of um, wonderful kind of, uh, even trips through galleries and museums. You know, they're, they're fantastic. But because I know the live experience, I can just kind of, I, it just whets my ha appetite more. The things I haven't been able to do is really about these ideas that I, uh, I've found a new way of doing them. Yeah, I'm, I really look forward to where that inspiration grows in the next couple of years to imagine that festival of the future. And um, I think we're uh, going to expand that global perception, but more within our own home. So it's a really interesting um, take. Wesley, do you think that First Nation artists are sometimes limited by that label? Uh, there are two schools of thought there. Um, those who believe that being a First Nations artist stops them from being seen as an artist. And I've never really felt like that, to be honest. I felt like um, being a First Nations artist has helped define who I am and what I do. And the second group is really about saying, who's the audience or who's the context in which I'm, I'm performing or doing my work? And often we, in the First Nations environment, say our primary audience is our own community. It strengthens our own community. It, it validates and provides a public platform to speak. And I think that as a First Nations artist, I value that greatly. But as the festival director of Sydney Festival, I am beyond just you know, one particular community. You have to kind of jump around a lot. So as a First Nations artist, I'm happy to promote the idea that a First Nations artist can be in charge of the Sydney Festival and for, to be a role model in that way, to say to younger people, this is within our realm, you can do this. Uh, but those who want to go beyond the label, uh, mostly because there, there are sometimes connotations of worthiness or not as good as, because First Nations, um, they, they feel sometimes that it's, uh, you, just get a, you just get waved through without any kind of critical discourse. And I think that's changed a lot in the last, let's say, five to 10 years. There's a lot more critical discourse because there's a lot more work. And the, let's say 10 years ago, there was a real ticker box kind of mentality. You go, here's our one indigenous show. Here's our one First Nations artist. Here's our, and now we're seeing, especially at Sydney Festival, there's you know a dozen or more shows and artists work being shown so you can see the the complexity it's not just about representing first nations perspectives through one viewpoint but multiple viewpoints are possible um, and i think again the digital environment is one in which you can see multiple viewpoints 
of a First Nations perspective, be it you know a, a queer perspective, a, a regional or remote perspective, a, a deeply urban dance, or a uh, a, a wonderful large-scale visual arts projection project and you start to build your understanding of a First Nations cultural viewpoint through these multiple uh, parameters if you like as opposed to just having the single experience and as we know in Indigenous Australians we represent well let's say four to five percent of the population and so the chances that most Australians will have a face-to-face, one-on-one experience with an Indigenous person in this country is just statistically a bit hard. So the idea that performing arts, visual arts, film and television, screen culture are wonderful ways of understanding more about us and also meaning that the, as an Indigenous artist you can then go, I can move from environment to environment where I'm in an all Indigenous environment or I'm just the doctor on Home and Away. And that's what I think the fluidity is what we want more. Yeah, well said. Wesley, how can we contribute to making our future Australia more aware and respectful of the wisdom of our Indigenous culture? Well, I look, to be honest, in my lifetime, and I'm 51 now, uh, I just love the idea of the progress that's already been gained in this last, let's say, 20 years. Actually, if you go back to 1988 and the bicentennial year, And from that point on, you start to see a whole range of indigenous arts and cultural institutions, companies, uh, the rise of careers of uh, different indigenous artists. You you know, you don't get myself or Deborah Malman or Ursula Jovic or Wayne Blair, uh, Leah Purcell. All of these artists have come through in these last, let's say, 20, 30 years. And there's been a real progress there, I think. What can people do? It's really about engaging. Um, I think you have to be uh, quite willful not to engage in Indigenous storytelling now. And it's really about keeping an ear out and listening for it, watching it. It was interesting uh, in 2020, uh, the, the two highest rated dramas on, sta- on, on screen were ABC's Mystery Road and um, the, the Deborah Malman piece Total Control. And you go, both Indigenous basically stories involved there. So I think people are engaging and they want to because they know it's an important issue. And as I said earlier, the idea that climate change, uh, I I see a a huge people's movement around the notion of climate change. And so people keep an ear out and they look to different storytelling to do that. And I think the cultural burning has been one of those things that has been crossing over from the news into um, artwork, uh, into documentation as well and so you and in the academics field and so you're finding group storytelling coming just basically from awareness and participation wow i um i think it's a really exciting time as we embrace and see how that um really comes to light moving forward mm. um What are you most excited about in respect to digital futures and the emerging First Nation story? I I just love that, you know, people talk about the digital native, you know, that idea that the generation that's grown up in the digital space and to watch the digital native of Australia. (laughs) Well, that's a really terrible (laughs) group of words, but the First Nations digital native is extraordinary. I'm, I'm looking at Uh, young people now who are getting into gaming in a way, in a big way. So this idea that cultural material can be formed in a game environment and that you can engage in that. I I saw some of the work from Brett Levy, who has done a lot of, um, uh, let's call it VR work, uh, but, but digital environments that you can look at the history of a location. This one work that he did was looking at the streets of Sydney and you can then kind of go in and out of uh, 230 years ago or present day, and you see this kind of ghosting of the present day city, but seeing also the indigenous history that was there. And I think that's brilliant because it's giving people this access to the long history of our country, not just the last 230 years. And I I think too that um, it will allow us, like one of the big things I'm doing is trying to go back home to Strabrak Island, Minjiraba, Kwandamuka country where I come from, and seeing that we can actually have careers 
and base ourselves in more remote parts of the world. We don't necessarily have to live in inner city Sydney to be engaging and uh, publicly expose our work and show our work that we can see more and more that artists, First Nations artists, can be engaged in international conversations from being on country, sitting on their country, still going out with family um, and, and their circles, doing culture and still being on country and engaging in conversations with the UN or making their work and uh, broadcasting it to the world. I think that's going to be amazing. Yeah, I agree. I absolutely agree. Um, before we wrap up, I have one last question for you, Wesley. What do you hope you will be remembered for as your legacy oh. as the Sydney Festival director? Uh, well, look, maybe it's best to say, what did I hope to achieve? And others can decide whether I achieved it or not. Um, I think that the First Nation storytelling has really shifted in the nation, that it's not just because of me, but I've been part of a wave of people going, how do I engage with the indigenous storytelling of this nation and be it be part of my life? And so at Sydney Festival, the First Nations work's been important. Works of scale by Australian artists have been very important. And this notion of collaboration that often there's been, uh, especially in the arts, the sense of a comp that competition was the best way to move forward. But I think that there's been more collaboration in the last, let's say, five years of my time, where you're working with companies to help achieve their goals. And that when you think of a company like Mughalan Performing Arts here in, in Sydney, um, we, they've been participating in the Sydney Festival for every year that I've been here. And to watch them grow in both their capacity, but also their, um, their influence, if you like, nationally, has been very, very important to me. And I hope that it's not just these next five years, or these last five years, but the next five years, they'll continue to grow because the precedent has been set. There's a now a new precedent and they have to refer to this status quo, not what was there five years ago. Yeah, I think that's a very powerful legacy and I think you're much too modest, I think. Yeah. Um, records will show it has absolutely been achieved and um, I speak on behalf of NBN and having a great collaboration <laughs> with the Sydney Festival in my time. Um, I want to thank you so much for your time this morning, Wesley. It was incredible. And I, um, I think we have a really exciting future to look forward to as digital possibility really helps both empower our First Nation arts and culture and just our general creativity in, um, in all of ourselves, whether we're testing it at home in our um, join on an online painting right through to maybe finding our next um, amazing artists. Absolutely. And the means of production are right at our fingertips, you know, even though sometimes the, the technical things can fall over or whatever they do. But there's something now that you can make at home and you can talk to an audience around the world. That's amazing. And it's great to have the NBN on board. Well, thank you. And I want to thank everyone for watching Dalaringi, ours, yours, and everyone's digital features and First Nations stories this morning. I'd like to thank Wesley again for his time and encourage our viewers to attend Sydney Festival events in the upcoming weeks, as well as uh, those around the city and those online. Please let us know your thoughts today on um, live stream by completing the audience survey that can be found on the Sydney Festival live stream webpage. That's sydneyfestival.org.au forward slash live stream. Thanks for watching. I'm Jennifer and thank you, Wesley. Thanks, Jennifer. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.